Hello and welcome to today's lesson. This lesson is going to be over the topic of making inferences, which is an important GED reading skill. So what we're going to look at in this lesson is this ability that you need when you read to make educated guesses from a text. This skill shows up not only in the RLA or Reasoning Through Language Arts GED, but also on the Social Studies test. So for those of you who lack confidence or reading skills, inference can be a little bit scary to try to attempt, but I'm going to walk you through some strategies for how to do it. And the good news is you already actually know how to do it. You might just not realize that you know. So first of all, this word infer, you may see this on the GED. It's not a word that a lot of people use in their day-to-day -day conversation. So it's a good vocab word to learn. What does it mean? It's a verb. It means to make a conclusion or an educated guess based on reasoning and evidence. So if you were going to use this word in a sentence, based on what I've read, I infer that Anna's mother doesn't really understand her. In other words, I make an educated guess that Anna's mother doesn't really understand her. And this word infer is where we get that bigger word inference, which is the noun form. So an inference is literally an educated guess. How to infer. As I mentioned, you already know how. You actually make inferences all the time, often without realizing you're doing it. For example, if you walk into a room and let's say you find poop smeared all over the lowest part of the wall and your toddler's discarded diaper is lying next to it, you would probably infer that the toddler removed his diaper and decided to use the contents as art supplies. It's a reasonable guess based on the evidence, even though you didn't literally see it happen. You didn't actually see the toddler take his diaper off, reach in, and start drawing with what he found. But based on seeing the poop on the wall, it's on the lowest part of the wall where a toddler could reach, the diaper's there. It really isn't rocket science to make a guess that the toddler did it. Another example. Based on traffic slowing down and hearing sirens in the distance, you might infer that there's an accident ahead of you on the road. Now, you don't know this for absolute certain. You haven't literally seen the accident. But based on the available evidence, it seems the most likely scenario. So again, you do inferences almost on a daily basis. It's just part of life. But it sometimes is a little bit intimidating to do it when you're reading especially if you're not very confident as a reader. So let's do a few exercises. Let's imagine, if you will, that you're watching a creepy movie. Now the main character, naturally a very pretty blonde woman, enters this room. And uh, let's add a little scary music. All right, so there's creepy music. And she walks in the room, and maybe the room, the music gets a little louder as she approaches that shower curtain. What's going to happen if this woman gets near the shower curtain? Well, probably nothing good, right? So, based on your knowledge of movies, particularly scary movies, you can probably guess that if the woman gets near the shower curtain, Something bad is going to jump out, maybe an axe murderer. Um, or maybe she's going to look behind the shower curtain and find something horrible in the bathtub. Or a third possibility is maybe she's going to find nothing in the bathtub, but since she's distracted looking by, behind the shower curtain, someone's going to creep up behind her with a weapon. You know, these are all logical guesses based on the available evidence and our background knowledge. So inference in a nutshell, you take what you read, you combine it with what you already know, and that gives you what you infer. When you're using what you read, you want to use actual quotes from the text as your evidence. So if you're trying to make inferences based on a reading passage, 
make sure there's an actual quote that backs up your thinking. What you know might be background knowledge that you have. It might be your own life experience. It could be something else that you read that's related. Now on the GED, what they're going to do is have you make inference based on very generalized life knowledge that you have plus whatever they're having you read. And so what you're doing is you're putting two and two together. You're making an educated guess. If you want to look at a step-by-step -step process for this, first you want to read the passage. Now there's some debate over whether it's better to read the question first or the passage first on these types of questions that you see on the GED. What I will tell you from my experience as a teacher, I think it's better if you read the passage, just kind of skim reading, just so you have a basic understanding of what it's about, then read the test question. Then you can go back to the passage and find or possibly list any relevant details. So because you've already glanced at the passage, you have a rough idea of where to look to find the answer to the test question usually. You might have to reread the passage Sometimes you might have to reread it a couple times if it's a hard question. And you don't have to literally write down relevant details, but for some of you, you might find that helpful if you just have a piece of scratch paper and you can write down, pull things together, and try to determine what they mean. So let's try a little activity. I know that you're not in a classroom with me, literally, you're at home, but just play along in your mind or if you've got a piece of paper and you want to write this down, this is a great little mental exercise for doing inference. I'm going to show you a picture and then you try to infer answers to my questions. And we'll do a couple of pictures. All right, so here's a picture right here. Go ahead and get a good look at the picture, take in the details. You know, look at the background of the picture as well as the people in it. So first of all, how is the girl feeling? What emotions? Now, how do you know that she's feeling those emotions? What evidence do you have? Now, myself, I look at the picture and I say, this girl's clearly unhappy. She's actually sad. And my evidence, the reason I know she's sad is she's crying and she's clinging to this man. Now, why do you think she's feeling this way? Look at the picture, look at the details, and see if you can figure out why is the girl sad? What's making her sad? Now, I'm going to give you a little piece of evidence to help you further. The title of this picture is Drop Off. So does knowing that title give you any new clues about this image? Go ahead and think for a few more seconds. Now what this image is actually meant to be showing is a little girl that doesn't want to be dropped off at school. And the way that you might infer that is from that title drop off that might have helped you. Also, if you look at the picture, you can see some parking lot lights in the background and some scenery that kind of looks like a parking lot. And if you look at the little girl, she's wearing a school uniform, plus she's got a backpack. The way she's holding the man is the way a child will often cling if they don't want to be separated from someone. So those are all clues that might have led you to infer that it's a little girl that doesn't want to be dropped off at school. Let's try another picture. So take a good look, take in the details. Where do you think this is taking place? And when do you think it's taking place? What time of year or time of day? Why is the woman touching the tree? I mean, what's really going on with this woman? Now I'm gonna give you the title of this picture and let's see if that sparks any ideas. 
The picture is called memories. Does that help you to infer further what this picture is about? Give you a couple more seconds to think. So first of all, let's consider when and where we think this might be. I mean, based on the fact that there's a bunch of trees, we can probably infer that this is some sort of forest. Now, as for what time of year, we can infer that this is winter. And we can do that because the ground is white, so it looks like there's snow and the trees don't have leaves on them. Now, did anyone manage to infer what time of day this is? If you look at the way the woman's shadow falls and the way the light shows up in this picture, it's probably morning. Now, another important detail that you might have noticed in the picture is what the woman is touching on the tree. She's touching a heart that's been carved into the tree. And knowing that the title of this is Memories, we can probably infer that she's remembering someone that she loves or that she loved in the past. I look at this picture and I assume or infer that probably they broke up because her posture seems a little bit sad. She's taking the time to stand in the forest, touching the heart gently. So to me, it looks like probably this relationship ended and she's remembering it maybe sadly maybe she misses him all right let's do one last picture so take in the details what is the dad doing in this picture Why is the little girl standing behind him? Do you think that he knows the little girl is there? What do you think this little girl actually wants? What's going on in this picture? All right, so as for what the dad is doing, um, some people look at this picture and infer that the dad is working. Now, I look at the picture and I infer that he's actually playing a game or surfing online, that he's doing something he enjoys rather than work. And the reason I make that inference is because of his posture. If you look, he's leaning forward like he's interested and he's leaning on his hand rather than using his keyboard or his mouse. So it looks like he's viewing something rather than actually typing. It also looks like he's kind of smiling and he's pleased with what he's doing. To me, that's not the posture most people have if they're working at a computer. Now, he might really love his job, but that's just my inference. Now, as to why this little girl is standing behind him and what she wants, we see that she's dragging a kite on the floor and you can see from her posture, she's kind of up on her tippy toes. She's leaning on her dad's chair. So we might infer from what the little girl's doing, she probably wants her dad to go outside and play with her with the kite. And from her posture, she kind of looks like her body language is a little bit hopeful, but at the same time, not too hopeful. Like the kite's dragging on the ground, she's not holding it. So kind of indicates that maybe the dad typically says no, or she knows that he's not gonna say yes right away. Those are all logical things we could infer from this picture. All right, let's look at inferring emotions or feelings. This is something you commonly get asked to do on the GED language arts test. First of all, you need to understand the difference between showing and telling in something that's written. Authors, particularly good authors, usually don't bluntly tell you everything. Instead, they show you through describing things. For example, a good writer isn't usually going to tell you the exact emotions a character is feeling. That's a little bit more of simple writing, more what like a children's author would do. 
a more complex skilled writer is going to use the character, the setting, and the conflict descriptions to let you see for yourself. They might describe a character's body language, things they're doing, things they're saying, how they're doing or saying it to show you the emotion. And they let you make an inference there based on your knowledge of human emotions, your knowledge of the character so far, and the evidence that you're being given. And this tends to make a story more satisfying for us, the readers. In nonfiction, writers will use facts and evidence to persuade you into a viewpoint or sometimes an action that they want for you. Now, if it's something like a history text, they might tell you what they're going to prove to you before they show you the evidence, or they might not. It depends on how they want to go about persuading you. And if a writer is trying to persuade you into an action, sometimes they like to be more subtle and have you infer the action because they don't want to turn you away. Um, sometimes people don't like being told exactly what to do by a writer. Instead, they want to make their own decision because people are a little bit stubborn. So let's compare two passages. We're considering this idea of showing versus telling. One of these passages is going to show, one of these passages is going to tell. And they're both dealing with the same emotion. I was so angry when I got my test back and realized I had failed. All right, let's look at the other passage. When the teacher placed the test on my desk, I glanced down at the red circled number at the top of the page. My muscles tensed and I felt my face grow hot. My eyes narrowed in on the page. Fuming, I realized that all the work I had done was for absolutely nothing. So again, these are both about the same emotion, but which passage is showing and which one is telling? Which one flat out tells you the emotion? Which one shows you the emotion? If you pointed to the second passage for showing, you were correct. And the first passage is telling us. In the first passage, it flat out tells us this person is angry. In the second passage, it shows us that he or she is angry by describing what the person does. So muscles tense, face grows hot, eyes narrow in, person is fuming. They feel like they've done all the work for absolutely nothing. Those are all evidence to show this person is angry. So let's do a little challenge. I strongly encourage you to do this on your own. This is a good little mental exercise. I'm going to assign you an emotion. I want you to try to come up with your own sentence where you show the emotion instead of telling about it. So I don't want you to use the word, but I want you to describe how that emotion looks or feels. Just the way you just saw in the last two passages. So you're gonna try to accomplish that second passage, show, not tell. But you only need one sentence. So I'm gonna pause to give you a minute to brainstorm. And um, if we were in class, I would invite you to share your idea, but obviously we're not, you're just listening to this lecture. So you could write down your idea or just keep it in your head. Here's your emotion, nervous. All right, so I'm going to give you a few seconds to think. Think about how you could show nervous in a sentence without actually using the word nervous. You could be describing yourself or you could maybe describe a fictitious character. If you're a parent, maybe think about how your child acts when they're nervous. Or maybe think about what you do or what your body does when you're nervous. I give you a few more seconds to think. All right, so how could we show nervous? These are a couple examples I came up with. Lucy stood there watching warily as she nibbled two fingernails. That, that word warily, it describes someone that's 
watching kind of suspiciously or carefully because they feel nervous or they feel like something bad might happen. And you further got this evidence that she's nibbling her fingernails. Nibbling fingernails is something people do when they're nervous. Here's another example. I tried to force myself to take deep breaths, but nothing could stop the thoughts racing through my head. That's a common symptom of nervousness. People's minds start racing and thinking too fast and they can't really calm themselves. And here's a third example. As Jose waited, he involuntarily kept tapping his feet against the linoleum floor. Now you don't know for sure that he's nervous, but tapping your feet without meaning to, that's a common bodily symptom that someone's nervous. All right, let's do one more. So again, all you need to do, try on your own to come up with a single sentence where you show the emotion without using the actual word for it. All right, ready? Your emotion this time is cheerful. All right, so I'm gonna give you a few seconds to think. You're trying to show that someone is cheerful without using the word cheerful. All right, so let's see what I came up with for showing cheerful. Whitney whistled as she washed the breakfast dishes. So it doesn't tell you that she's cheerful, but it infers it because she's whistling. That's something people often do when they're happy. As Kyle drove to work that morning, he found himself enthusiastically singing along with his favorite song came on the radio. Sorry, when his favorite song came on the radio. So here again, it's kind of an involuntary action singing along, that's something people do when they're happy. And that word enthusiastically, that tells you that he's doing it with like a happy energy. All right, here's another little exercise. These two passages tell a story. So they're two different passages, but they both relate to the same story. Your job is to try to infer what's going on here. See if you can infer the background so here's our first passage. Kelly pulled up her last message from Damien and read it silently to herself for the dozenth time that morning, beaming from ear to ear. She swiped over to her photos from the night before, memorizing all the wonderful details in his handsome face. Involuntarily, she found herself humming the John Legend song he had played for her. She gave a sigh. Scumbag, Nina muttered under her breath as she scrolled down. The text seemed to stretch for miles, each one another dagger, or sorry, another arrow to her heart. Flirty teasing, compliments, promises, little inside jokes. Upon hearing the toilet flush, she quickly and quietly placed the phone back on the nightstand. She wiped her eyes as thoroughly as she could. Still awake, babe? Damien grinned as he strode into the bedroom. So let's see if we can infer the story that's going on here. First of all, let's consider Kelly. Um, what emotion can we infer Kelly is feeling? Well, we see that she is beaming from ear to ear. She's humming involuntarily. She gives a little sigh. So we could infer that Kelly is happy. Um, she's rereading this text message from a man for the dozenth time, and it makes her smile. She goes over to memorize all the details in his handsome face in a picture. Okay, so it sounds like she's in love, right? She's got it bad. So Kelly's in love with this man. Um, she's humming a John Legend song he played for her, so probably a romantic song we could infer. Now let's look over at Nina. So Nina refers to someone else as a scumbag as she's scrolling on a phone. 
There's flirty teasing, compliments, promises, inside jokes. And instead of making her feel happy, these texts are arrows to her heart. So what could we infer about those texts? Why are those things making her angry instead of happy? Well, we could infer those texts might not be to her. Maybe those texts were made to someone else. We see that when the toilet flushes, Nina immediately tries to quietly put this phone back on the nightstand. So we could infer from that that maybe it isn't her phone. Maybe it's someone else's phone. She wipes her eyes so we can infer that she was crying or about to cry. Damien comes in the room. Still awake, babe? He grins as he strode into the bedroom. So we could infer from the second passage that Nina is involved with Damien. She has gone through his phone and she's seen that he's messaging someone else. And we probably could infer that it was Kelly. Or who knows, maybe there's a third woman. But in a nutshell, we can infer that there's a love triangle going on here. We weren't told there was a love triangle, but we were shown through two related passages. Kelly's in love with Damien and probably doesn't know about Nina. And Nina has just found out about Kelly or maybe even a third or fourth woman. We can further infer that Damien is a two-timing jerk. All right, so things to look for when we're trying to do an inference. How are characters behaving? What are they doing? Those can show us emotion. Watch out for adverbs. Adverbs are great clues. An adverb, if you're not familiar with it, if it's been a while, is a word that describes a verb. So in other words, it tells how something is done. Some examples, um, adverbs typically, but not always, end in L-Y. So any words you can think of that end in L-Y, those are probably adverbs smoothly, carefully, wisely, happily, gently, teasingly, arrogantly, loudly, gently, quietly. These are all examples of adverbs. They tell you how something is done and typically they imply an emotion. Not always, but frequently. Now there's also adverbs like suddenly or abruptly. Those indicate a rapid change and those are excellent clues that emotion might be happening there. If someone does something suddenly or abruptly, it means they very quickly do it. Usually that's because of an emotional reason or because of something else that has happened that they're reacting to. So that's a good hint to look at that part of the passage. If a character says something, don't just look at what they say, but also how they say it. For example, if a man asks the question, how are you feeling, honey? And the woman says, fine, with pursed lips. She said the word fine, but her lips are pursed, which indicates she's not smiling. She's kind of holding her face tightly. Probably she doesn't really mean that she's fine. Probably she's the exact opposite. He's possibly in a lot of trouble. If she says fine and she's smiling, fine, she said with a smile, well, then she probably actually means that she's fine. Watch for descriptions and or actions of the eyes, mouths, hands, and face. Eyes, mouths, faces, hands, these are body parts that frequently show emotion. Writers like to use these body parts when they're describing emotion. So always pay attention if it mentions those parts of a character's body. Now, sometimes they could use, you know, like feet tapping was an example I gave earlier. But eyes, mouths, hands, and faces, those are your best indicators. All right, so let's look at a sample passage. This is a passage from the novel Anne of Green Gables. Great novel. During this dialogue, the child had remained silent, her eyes roving from one to the other, all the animation fading out of her face. Suddenly, she seemed to grasp the full meaning of what had been said. Dropping her precious carpet bag, she sprang forward a step and clasped her hands. You don't want me, she cried. I might have expected it. Nobody ever did want me. 
I might have known it was all too beautiful to last. I might have known nobody really did want me. Oh, what shall I do? I'm going to burst into tears. Burst into tears she did, sitting down on a chair by the table, flinging her arms out upon it and burying her face in them, she proceeded to cry stormily. Marilla and Matthew looked at each other helplessly across the stove. Neither of them knew what to say or do. Finally, Marilla stepped lamely into the breach. Well, well, there's no need to cry so about it. Yes, there is a need. The child raised her head quickly, revealing a tear-stained face and trembling lips. You would cry too if you were an orphan and had come to a place you thought was going to be home and found that they didn't want you. Oh, this is the most tragical thing that has ever happened to me. Something like a reluctant smile, rather rusty from long disuse, mellowed Marilla's grim expression. So, having read this passage, what two words describe this child's feelings in this scene? Our choices are dramatic and practical, enthusiastic and disappointed, disappointed and dramatic, satisfied and practical. So let's look back at the passage. Let's look at the child's actions first. What does she actually do? Well, here's something she does. She drops her precious carpet bag. She springs forward. She clasps her hands. So there's three actions all in one sentence. She cried. Now that word cried, it can literally mean that someone is crying while they're speaking. It can also mean that they're speaking loudly or with emotion. She bursts into tears. She sits down in a chair. She flings her arms upon it. She buries her face in her arms. She starts crying stormily. There's a bunch more things she does. And she raises her head quickly, revealing a tear-stained face and trembling lips. All right, so here's a whole bunch of actions that all indicate this child's emotions. We probably could answer the question just based on the actions, but let's look at whether there's any adverbs we could use as clues, especially words like suddenly. Yes, there is one suddenly. So if we look at what happened when suddenly shows up, suddenly she grasped the full meaning of what had been said. Now, if this passage were a little bit longer, what happened before this passage is this child was told that it was a mistake. She was brought to live with this couple, but they actually didn't want a girl. They wanted a boy. And she's just been told that. Um, you don't know that, however. So you're inferring something was said and the child is reacting with emotion to what was said. Let's look if there's any description or mention of her face, her hands, her eyes, or her mouth. Because remember, those body parts are prime indicators of emotion. Her eyes are roving from one to the other, meaning from one person to the other. She's in the room with two other people, Matthew and Marilla. All the animation fades out of her face. So you picture a child looking from one adult to another, and as she does so, all the animation and happiness fades out of her face. Here's another description. She clasped her hands, buried her face in them, referring to her arms. And we have a description of tear-stained face and trembling lips. So there's lots of indications of this child's emotions. Let's go back to the question. So is she dramatic and practical, enthusiastic and disappointed, disappointed and dramatic, satisfied and practical? Well, right away, you, you know this child is definitely disappointed, right? Because she's crying. She looks at the adults after they've spoken and the animation fades out of her face. So we can eliminate the two choices that don't list disappointed. Now, is she also enthusiastic or dramatic? Well, she bursts into tears. She drops her bag. She flings herself on the table. You look at what words she uses. 
Oh, this is the most tragical thing that has ever happened to me. That's pretty dramatic, right? So we can infer the child's feelings are disappointed and dramatic. Now, you need to be cautious and make sure when you're inferring that you do have all the facts. Because if you're making a hasty inference without all the facts, or in spite of some of the facts, you're ignoring facts, you can come up with a very wrong conclusion. This is a real example from history. You may have heard of this story before. On October 30th of 1938, hundreds of Americans made the same faulty inference. That evening, the CBS Mercury Theater on Air, which was a radio program, presented a radio broadcast entitled The War of the Worlds, which was an adaptation of an H.G. Wells sci-fi novel. <clears throat> Actor Orson Welles, who's shown in the picture here, told the story of an invasion from Mars, and the story was rewritten to be like a news broadcast. So it's a radio play, but it's done as though it were a news broadcast. He's posing as a news anchor, and he tells listeners that he has a grave announcement. He goes on, both the observations of science and the evidence of our eyes lead to the inescapable assumption that those strange beings who landed in the Jersey farmland tonight are a vanguard of an invading army from the planet Mars. People actually believed him. So literally, radio listeners in 1938 thought that Martians had invaded the United States in New Jersey. There was a panic, several hundred people panicked, and there were a few people that were even injured in the panic. Um, police got spent hours having to deal with phone calls from frantic people. And it's really quite ridiculous, but it scared the living daylights out of people in 1938. How could these people have avoided jumping to false conclusions? You know, you tune into the radio, there's a news broadcast. Um, something that happened that's a bit of background knowledge of this story there was a different radio program that was very popular at the time that most people were listening to at that time. But this very popular radio program had a musical guest that most people hadn't heard of. And so if you think about what people typically do if there's a musical guest they haven't heard of on a TV show, typically they change the channel. That's what my husband and I do anytime Saturday Night Live has a musical guest because we usually haven't heard of them, so we change the channel for a few minutes, or we fast forward. Well, in 1938, you couldn't fast forward, but you could change the channel to a different radio station. That's what a lot of people did. So a lot of people didn't hear the beginning of the broadcast, they heard partway into the broadcast. That was part of why they reached the false conclusion that it was actually a news story. But there was still evidence that this wasn't real. For example, in the broadcast, Orson Welles, the actor, said, within two hours, three million people moved out of New York. Now that statement is an important clue because as we know, background knowledge, it is impossible for a city to get cleared out that quickly. Think about the logistics of trying to clear three million people out of New York in two hours time. It's not gonna happen. You're gonna end up with massive traffic jams and no one's going anywhere. So if you hear that 3 million people have moved out of a city in two hours time, especially in 1938 with cars that didn't go as fast as today's cars and a lot fewer cars, so more people would be on foot. Yeah, that's, that's a pretty good indication. It's probably not the truth. If people had read the newspaper listing of radio programs playing that night, they would have seen that CBS had actually scheduled War of the Worlds to be broadcast on October 30th. So if War of the Worlds is scheduled in advance, then it can't really be a news story about a Mars invasion because you'd have to be a prophet to know that this invasion was gonna happen in advance. If people had turned the radio dial and listened to a different station, they would have been able to figure out the show wasn't authentic because if it was an authentic broadcast, they would have heard the story reported on other stations. And you think about if Martians invaded Earth, you would hear that story on pretty much every channel. 
I mean, they would be interrupting every available show just to get news crews reporting on this story. Furthermore, during the intermissions on the broadcast, the CBS radio announcer actually reminded the audience that they were listening to a drama. They were told repeatedly, this is a drama. So yeah, there were several clues that people should have looked at to avoid making a faulty inference. Don't be like those people. So make sure that your inferences match with the facts that you have. Make sure you can back up your inferences with some form of evidence. If you're making inferences based on a reading passage, make sure you can find a quote in that passage or a couple of words in the passage, a fact, something that backs up what you're guessing. And don't infer if a question is actually asking you for facts. So pay attention to the question itself. If it's asking for something factual, then don't make a guess, actually read the passage, find the fact that it wants. Here's another passage we can work with. The words still echoed in my ears. You're pregnant, about two months along. The doctor broke the news to me after my examination. She spoke with a thick accent. I guess that she was from India. The people at the community clinic were very nice to me, especially the social worker. She told me about the alternatives. I could keep the baby, have an abortion, or give it up for adoption. They didn't know that my parents split up when I was 15. I ran away and met Larry. We lived together in Uptown and ran errands for his important friends. Then I moved back with Mama after we had a fight. I walked down Wilson Avenue back to the apartment. The heat brought people out on the sidewalks, and they were hanging from the porches. I felt that they were staring at me. I had to tell Larry what happened. I walked up the dark, musty stairway to apartment 252A. I knocked and knocked, but he didn't answer. When I rang the office bell, I asked Sam where Larry was. Went to Texas, Sue. Left about two nights ago. He took everything with him but the roaches. You know he still owes me back rent. Is there anything I can do for you, he asked with a startled look of concern. I was shocked and turned away from Sam as I felt tears trickle down my face. Dang that, Larry. Did he know too and then leave me? I ran from the building and walked to the lakefront until the locusts buzzed in the trees. They were there, yet I couldn't see them, just like my baby. Pregnant, pregnant, they seemed to say. Were they happy for me or were they mocking me? I really couldn't tell. All right, so we have a passage here about this girl, Sue. She's traumatized because she's just found out that she's unexpectedly pregnant, and it's not good news. What can you infer about Sue's childhood and adolescence based on this passage? So here's our choices. She was brought up in a happy home. Her parents put Sue's needs ahead of, their, of theirs. She and her family grew up in the South. Sue was forced to grow up more quickly than usual, or as one of several children in her family, Sue didn't get enough attention. Well, let's check the passage. And where do we find mention of her childhood? Here we are. So Sue's parents split up when she was 15. She ran away and met Larry, lived with him for a while. Um, that part about running errands for his important friends what do you infer that might mean? I read that and I think, hmm, running errands for his important friends. I kind of think maybe there's a little bit of drug dealing or something going on. And then she moved back in with Mama after she and Larry had a fight. So based on that little passage there, that little paragraph, what does that back up? Was she brought up in a happy home? Well, parents split up when she was 15. She ran away. That doesn't sound very happy. Um, parents put Sue's needs ahead of theirs. Here again, they split up and she ends up running away and not living with her parents and she's only 15. Doesn't sound like parents put her needs ahead of theirs. She and her family grew up in the South. Well, it could be true, but we really don't have any evidence to back up that she and her family grew up in the South. There's no mention of the setting. They don't mention the temperature or any details about where she grew up. 
So it could be true, but we don't have evidence to back it up. Sue was forced to grow up more quickly than usual. Well, she ran away, she moved in with a guy, she lived together and was running errands for his friends. Yeah, that sounds like she's having to grow up more quickly than usual. So that could be true, but let's look at the last choice, just to be sure. As one of several children in her family, Sue didn't get enough attention. Is there any mention at all of siblings? Well, let's look. Parents split up. Da, 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 da. Nope, there's not a single mention of a sibling. So we have no idea whether Sue actually has other children in her family. Therefore, the only choice that we can back up with evidence is D. Let's do another question. What can you infer about Sue and Larry's relationship? They love each other very much. They enjoy living and working together. They're not able to work out their problems with each other. Larry is happy about Sue's pregnancy or Larry wants Sue to give up the baby for adoption. Let's see what we can find about their relationship. So she met him when she was about 15. We know that they lived together, but we also know that she moved back in with her mother after she and Larry had a fight. Now we also know that Larry went to Texas without telling Sue, and he's been gone for two days without ever telling his girlfriend. All right, so based on that evidence, do they love each other very much? Maybe, but the, she moves out rather than try to make up after a fight, and he leaves town without telling her. That's not really evidence of love there. They enjoy living and working together. Well, they're not living together now, and they're not working together. So that one doesn't work. They are not able to work out their problems with each other. Well, let's see. They had a fight, and she moves out rather than try to reconcile. He leaves town, doesn't tell her. Okay, so that evidence backs up choice C, but let's keep going. Larry is happy about Sue's pregnancy. Well, we know that Sue was on her way to tell Larry what happened when she found out he'd left town. So actually, we have no evidence that Larry knows about the pregnancy. Based on our information here, he probably doesn't. So he can't very well be happy if he doesn't know. And he probably wouldn't have left town if he was happy. Um, choice E, Larry wants Sue to give up the baby for adoption. Well, here again, we don't have any evidence of that because he doesn't appear to know, and he's left town without saying anything to Sue. So the only answer that we can back up with evidence is choice C. Last question. Why does Larry go to Texas? He must find a job to support Sue and the coming baby. He's behind on rent payments. He can no longer live in their roach-infested apartment. Larry knows about the pregnancy, or the passage does not say why he left. So let's find where it talks about Larry going to Texas. Does it say anything about finding a job to support Sue and the baby? No, because again, we don't have any evidence that he even knows about the baby. So not choice A. Could it be that he's behind on rent payments? You know, he still owes me back rent. Okay, he is behind on rent payments, but do we know that that's why he left? We actually don't. We would have to make an inference. Let's keep going. He can no longer live in their roach-infested apartment. He took everything with him but the roaches. Okay, so we know the apartment is infested with roaches. But here again, do we actually know that the roaches are why he left? We don't actually have anything telling us that. Larry knows about the pregnancy. Well, Sue hasn't told him, so how would he know? We have no evidence to back up that he knows. So in this question, why does Larry go to Texas? 
This is asking us for a fact. It doesn't say anything about guessing or inferring. It doesn't ask why do you think he went to Texas. They're wanting a factual answer. Now we know that it could be because he's behind on rent. It could be because of the roaches in the apartment. But we don't have any further evidence to show us that it's definitely one of those two. So our best option is option E. The passage does not say why he left. We don't want to infer when we're supposed to give a factual answer instead of an educated guess. These are some question stems you may see on the GED test. These indicate that they want you to make an inference. They might literally say, what can you infer about? That's pretty clear they want you to make an educated guess. What might have happened prior to the excerpt? If they use that word might, that indicates possibility, so they're asking for an educated guess. What is the likely reason that? That word likely, instead of definite, here again they're asking you to make a guess. How did the character generally feel about? If they ask about feelings or emotions, they're probably wanting you to infer based on the evidence. What can we assume? That word assume means that they want you to make a guess. You might also be asked to infer a character's motives. This is another type of question that GED loves, inferring why someone does something. So why is a character acting in a certain way? Why do people do things? There are tons, tons of reasons. A lot of times emotion, but sometimes things that they want. I mean, people do things because of anger, disgust, friendship, respect, love, guilt, greed, envy, fear, stubbornness, boredom, grief, revenge, worry, confusion, conflict, shock, heartache, pain, morals, pride, embarrassment, peer pressure. You see how many different motivations people could have? Happiness could be a motivation. Money, fame, mercy, empathy. And there's even more motivations besides. So there's no limit to what could actually be motivating a character. But you have to look at evidence and try to figure out, based on the evidence, what do you think is their motive? So some general rules to be aware of. It's much easier to infer emotions and feelings than writing than it is motives. Motives are often a little bit less obvious and you're gonna to have to do a little bit deeper thinking to figure out a motive. You have to take what you know about the character's personality, needs, wants, and then look at what they are saying and doing. So some key questions to ask yourself. What does this character need? Or more importantly, what does this character want? A need is something necessary to live and function, so in other words, bare essentials. A want is something that can improve someone's quality of life. Make sure you understand the difference between a need and a want. Wants tend to cause more emotion than needs, and they're usually what motivate a character most. People are more motivated by what they want than they are what they need. How does this character's behavior help them in getting what they need or want? That's a good key question to ask yourself. Or lastly, do the character's words and actions match with what they actually need or want? All right, so we're gonna go back to same passage we read earlier in the lesson from Anna Green Gables about the child who's been rejected, all right? What does this child actually need? Like bare bones essentials. She, she needs shelter, right? She needs food, she needs an adult to take care of her. What does she actually want? As with most characters, what she wants is actually more significant and is gonna be a better clue to her motivation. To find what a character wants, look at what makes them emotional. 
A lot of times they won't say, I want blah, blah, blah. But look at what makes them emotional and look at what they say. So if you look at the passage, you don't want me, she cried. I might have expected it. Nobody ever did want me. I might have known nobody really did want me. You would cry too if you were an orphan and come to a place you thought was going to be home and found out they didn't want you. See how she keeps repeating that phrase about wanting? So what this child wants is literally to be wanted. She wants to find a home. She specifically wants this particular home. But what she wants most, her primary motive, is she wants someone to want her. So how might her needs and wants influence her motives moving forward in the story? Try inferring. If you were this child, more than anything else, you want someone to want you, and you want to stay with this couple, you want their home to be your home, how might that influence your motives moving forward in the story? Well, with most children, they'd probably try to be on their best behavior because they'd be afraid that if they misbehave, they're going to get sent back. Um, they might try to bribe or sweet talk the couple, try to act like a perfect little angel. Those are all reasonable assumptions for how the child's wants and needs might influence her motives. Now, what's interesting about this particular book and why it's such a good book is because the child has the intention of behaving well, but actually her behavior is constantly not bad behavior, just mischievous or she makes mistakes. And this couple actually ends up wanting her in spite of the fact that she keeps getting into trouble. They don't want her because she's a good child. They actually end up wanting her because they realize she wants them and she needs them, which makes it quite a nice story. If you haven't read this book, it's a great book. All right, so let's finish off there. Thanks for viewing this lesson. I hope this was helpful.